Good afternoon. My name is Dan Xiao, a regional coordinator for the 2022 CAP lecture tour. I am filling in for this lecture's regional coordinator, Dr. Sorry Das from the University of Lethbridge. Before we get started, I have a couple of announcements about how the talk will proceed. All questions will be handled at the conclusion of the speaker's presentation. Please post your questions in the Zoom chat at any time. The questions will be posted, will be posed anonymously to the speaker by the MC. All students participating today are encouraged to remain after the talk and participate in a 30 minutes breakout informal discussion session with the speaker. We also invite any faculty or other attendees from the host institution to participate as well. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our host for today's CAP lecture tour talk, Prof Professor Bill Whelan from uh, the, the CAP lecture tour national coordinator, who will introduce our speaker on behalf of the University of Lethbridge. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Xiao. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the fourth uh, talk in the CAP uh, lecture tour series for 2022. Um, as Dr. Shaw said, I'm Bill Whelan, Vice President-Elect of the CEP, and I will act as host today. Uh, we had hoped to be able to have this talk in person at the University of Lethbridge and stream across Canada, but with the rising COVID cases uh, in January and February, the decision was made to have the lecture tour fully online. This talk was supposed to be hosted by the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, unfortunately, our hosts are unable to participate today because of a lockout at the University of Lethbridge, which started on February the 11th, and has unfortunately not been resolved. So I'm pleased to step in on their behalf. Uh, the lecture tour is sponsored uh, by the uh, Canadian Association of Physicists Foundation uh, uh, and, the, and the Canadian Association of Physicists, the national network of 1,700 physicists working at universities, companies, and research institutions across Canada. The CAP works on behalf of Canadian physicists to support physics education and research and sponsors a number of physics activities, including this lecture tour uh, and national research conferences. The CAP also delivers a number of programs for undergraduate and graduate students, uh, including research conferences, physics scholarships and prizes, uh, uh, and a student advisory council. If you have not already joined the CAP, uh, please consider becoming part of Canada's largest network of physicists and physics students. It is free for undergraduate students and the first year of membership for graduate students is free as well. So here's the contact information uh, if you're interested in membership. Uh, today's talk will be 45 minutes followed by 10 minutes for questions. Uh, if you'd like to pose a question to the speaker, you can type your question in the chat at any time, uh, and one of the moderators will ask the question at the end of the talk. Following the talk today, you will have the option to join a breakout room uh, where you can speak directly uh, with the speaker, ask additional questions about the research, or questions about related career paths. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Paul Wiegert from the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Western University. Dr. Wiegert's research focuses on, on solar system dynamics, including uh, the topic of today's presentation, asteroids. Um, uh, his presentation today is titled Asteroids, why they are so interesting and why we worry about them. So on behalf of the CAP, I would, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Dr. Wiegert. Hi, Bill. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I will start sharing my screen. Something went funny there. Okay, here we go. So yes, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be here today and, and talk to you all about asteroids. The asteroids are scientifically interesting, but they're also sometimes 
uh, risk, uh, a source of risk. And we want to talk about that too and talk about whether we really need to worry about them very much or not. So, so I, I want to start by acknowledging that uh, I right now uh, I'm talking to you from Western University in London, Ontario, uh, which is located on the traditional territories of, territories of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lunapiwak, and Chinonkta nations on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties and with the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. And we recognize that this land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples who we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors to our society as well. So, um, just a, a, a heads up, if you will. So uh, later on in this talk, we will have a little quiz, which will be run by Kahoot. So those of you who know what a Kahoot is, know it's a little bit of an online quiz game. And if you want to participate, this will be coming up in about 15 minutes or so. Uh, the only thing you need to know is that if you want to participate, you will either need a second device, like your phone. If you're watching this on your laptop, you can use your phone. Or if you're watching this on your laptop, you will need a second browser window open when this comes around because you will see the questions on this screen. So you will, uh, you'll have to keep the screen open during the quiz and then you'll need a second browser tab open to answer in. And I'll give you a little bit more on that as we get a little bit closer, but just a heads up, you do not have to download any software to your computer. It's entirely within a web browser. And if you wanna get ready, you should navigate to Kahoot dot it k a h o o t dot it uh, and wait for a pin from me but that will come up in about 15 minutes or so just so you don't have to scramble at the very end just let you know so uh, this is a talk about our solar system and normally i have people shout out <laughs> the names of the planets as they recognize them you can see them here. Um, uh, but i won't ask you to do that uh, i can't actually see the chat but you can see how many of them you can guess before their names appear. Usually the last ones here are a little bit, a little bit uh, harder for people to guess. Probably somebody is shooting out Pluto, but Pluto is not a planet anymore. Some of you might remember that. We'll actually talk a little bit about Pluto in a second, but the, the planets are the main, uh, the main objects, the, the, the biggest objects in our solar system, except for the sun. Uh, but to understand the solar system, we need to know a little bit of physics actually. Uh, we know that the planets go around the sun, uh, but did you know um, Kepler's first law? So this uh, is physics, it's conservation of energy, conservation of angular momentum. Uh, bodies don't orbit the sun on perfect circles. Well, they actually can in principle. You're looking at three different ellipses here and the leftmost one with the E equals zero underneath it is actually a perfect circle. We characterize ellipses by their eccentricity, a number which goes from zero to one. And planets could orbit the sun on perfect circles, but actually none of them are on perfect circles, but their orbits are actually quite circular. And most of the planets are on orbits a little bit like the one in the center there, which has an eccentricity of 0.2. You can see that to the eye, it doesn't look all that different maybe, than a circle, but you can see the sun is a little bit off center. That's a characteristic of these orbits too. The sun is a, a focus, not at the center. And on the far right, you can see another example of an orbit which has a very elliptical orbit around 0.7. And you can see there, the sun is quite a ways off from the, what you might think is the geometrical center of the orbit. And that is also gonna be important. So this is the first thing that we need to to understand when we're talking about the solar system is how things orbit the sun. And so the key points that we've got here are that all bodies of all sizes, so not just the planets, but even smaller objects like asteroids, uh, asteroids are smaller than the planets, we'll see that. And they all, however, follow orbits within the solar system. And one of these ellipses is what we call an orbit. And in fact, even things which don't orbit the sun have to obey Kepler's first law. So for example, the moon, orbits the earth on an ellipse as well. Uh, orbits are not perfect circles. They are uh, oval in a very specific kind of way. The sun is not at the geometrical center of the orbit. 
And we're going to say that orbits do not change with time, but there is actually some very important fine print here. Uh, so keep that in mind. You can think of orbits as not changing, but we're going to see whether or not that's strictly true or not. So I'm going to take you on a tour of the solar system. We're going to start uh, at the sun and zoom outwards. And all of the orbits that you're going to see are going to be correct to scale. The planets themselves are a little bit bigger just to make them a bit more visible, but all the orbits are true to scale. You can see Mercury's orbit there. The sun is a little bit off center. Mercury's orbit is elliptical. And as we zoom out, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about this main asteroid belt, this blue region where actually there are millions of asteroids, though I've only shown you one. You see asteroid Ceres orbiting there within the asteroid belt. It's the largest of the asteroids. It's actually also a dwarf planet. We're going to signal dwarf planets in this animation with a yellow orbit, even though we're not going to talk about them too much here. Here you can see at the edge of the solar system, a number of yellow orbits. You might notice Pluto among them, but these are the dwarf planets. And you can see that their characteristics are a little bit different from those of the planets which are further inside. You'll also notice that blue region, that second asteroid belt, which we call the Kuiper belt, uh, which we won't have too much to say about, but we'll come back in again. So our solar system really sort of has two um, asteroid belts. So that's on YouTube, always interesting to see what YouTube pops up as a suggestion there. So, but here's a still frame from that movie. So you can see the inner solar system here. If you can see my cursor, hopefully not too badly, you can see that the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are there. And then this blue region, is between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And this is the main asteroid belt. This is where most of the asteroids live. Now, I mentioned that Ceres was a dwarf planet and Pluto is also a dwarf planet. Some of you might harbor memories of when Pluto was demoted from planet status. And this at least partly has to do with its size. And here you can see uh, to scale, the Earth, the Moon, Pluto, and Ceres. And you can see that Pluto, which is probably the largest of the dwarf planets, though it does have some competition, is, is certainly much smaller than the moon, for example, and Ceres is even smaller than that. So uh, the asteroids in the asteroid belt are all really quite small and quite a bit smaller than, than the planets, particularly if you remember the, the family portrait that we showed as the first slide there where the planets Jupiter and Saturn are, are even much bigger again. Now, even though the asteroids are smaller, that doesn't mean they're not interesting. Here's Ceres at about a thousand kilometers in diameter. It's the largest of the asteroids. Now it is airless, it is waterless, it's very rocky, and so maybe it doesn't seem all that interesting, but we'll talk about why these are scientifically very interesting in a second. You can see some intriguing white spots on it. Uh, you might wonder what those are. Those turn out to be sort of a salt deposit. Uh, Ceres is not completely inactive and there are sort of some, some, a little bit of geology going on there. Maybe we can call it that, but you can see it's nice and round. It's sort of like a world unto itself, even though it's fairly small. But the asteroids stretch down in size to very small objects. So this is about a thousand times smaller in diameter. Uh, asteroid Bennu, which is about 500 meters across and a really interesting object here. You can see the surface is very rough and covered in boulders. It's also airless, waterless, uh, and its shape, you might notice this kind of interesting top-like shape, which actually is caused by its rotation. Its rotation causes it to spin off material and take on this shape. It's particularly exciting because it was recently visited by the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft, which took these pictures, and which has a very important Canadian component. Um, a Canadian company built the uh, laser altimeter, it's sort of a laser which scans the surface and which produce the image you can see in the upper left here, uh, sort of a shape model of the asteroid, which allowed it to actually get close enough to the asteroid to, to land and take a sample. So the, the graphic that you see here is the spacecraft or a graphic, a representation of the spacecraft descending toward the surface. And you can see a little foot sticking out the bottom. And what happened was the spacecraft carefully moved down towards a pre-selected location safely away from big boulders that might cause damage. And when the foot touched down, it blew out some compressed gas and scooped up some of the material that was released and then backed away to retrieve a sample from the asteroid. So that's a, a very, very exciting mission uh, with a very important Canadian component in it as well. So, 
So Bennu is small, Ceres is large. Here's a, a partial family portrait, if we can call it that, of uh, some of the asteroids. Ceres, the largest, is on, there on the left. And I've put in a few pictures to scale of some of the largest asteroids. But Bennu, that, that really interesting asteroid, which we were just looking at, is actually so small that it would barely be a pixel to the scale. So asteroids really come in a wide range of sizes. And we might ask the question, exactly how many of them are there? Well, it turns out that this question doesn't really have an answer. Because as you go to smaller and smaller sizes, there are more and more of them. There are about three larger than 500 kilometers, but as you go down to smaller sizes, they become more numerous. And uh, there might be a million asteroids, about a kilometer in diameter or so, but they go on down to smaller sizes, meter sizes, centimeter sizes, millimeter sizes, as small as you want to go. So there really isn't a number of asteroids, though there certainly are you know, a number of some of the larger ones that we worry about. So if the asteroids, if there are so many of them and they come in this range of sizes, are they the smashed remnants of an exploded planet? That's one of the most common questions I get asked is that the asteroids come from an exploded planet. That's sort of an old theory. Uh, but now we actually think that the reverse happened. So what actually happened is that when the sun was being born and the planets were being born, they all started in a cloud of gas and dust, which was swirling in orbit around the sun. This cloud of gas and dust was also orbiting. And inside this, this cloud of gas, the minerals that were in it condensed and coagulated a little bit like snowflakes, gradually glow, growing into larger and larger pieces, which were essentially asteroids. So at one point, this cloud of gas contained a, a large number of asteroids orbiting within it, and gravity pulled these asteroids together to form the planets. So instead of the planets being, uh, the asteroid belt being formed from an exploded planet, we think rather that the planets themselves were formed from uh, asteroids and that this process for some reason, but probably due to Jupiter, the planet which is the most massive and which orbits just outside the asteroid belt, that planet probably prevented it from happening in the asteroid belt. So this is part of why asteroids are so interesting. It's because the planets are made of asteroids. But the planets, like the Earth, have undergone a lot of processing. If we imagine that the Earth is a chocolate cake, then the asteroids are like the ingredients that that cake was made out of. Um, and if you look at a cake, you might not know, unless you know a lot about cooking, that it's made of flour and cocoa and sugar and eggs and things like that. It's very hard to tell by looking at a cake what exactly it started out, uh, you know, what the ingredients were. So if you're interested in chocolate cakes, and who isn't, if you're interested in planets uh, like the Earth and who isn't, then you've got a lot to learn from the ingredients that they're made out of. Uh, in this case, asteroids for planets. So that's part of the reason that they're so exciting. So hopefully I've convinced you that asteroids are at least a little bit interesting, but why do we worry about them? So if we go back to this picture again, we've got the solar system and we've got the, the asteroid belt and it's between the orbits of Jupiter. But if you look carefully, you can see that the orbit of Earth here is well inside the orbit of Mars. If the asteroids are all inside the asteroid belt, excuse me, and if their orbits don't change with time, it seems like the Earth is pretty much safe from the asteroids. They're all contained away from the Earth. So what exactly is going on? Well, it turns out, if you remember, I said something about fine print. When I said that the orbits don't change with time, there's actually some fine print there and they can actually be changed. What happens is that the gravitational influence of the larger bodies in the solar system, like the planets, can cause what we call perturbations, which can slowly change the orbits. The orbits remain elliptical, but they slowly change over time. And this means that orbits can move out of the asteroid belt and any orbits which move towards the inner part of the solar system we call near Earth asteroids. And these are the ones we worry about. So what you're looking at here, what you're about to see is a computer simulation of uh, the asteroid belt, the solar system. So at the very center here, you've got the sun, and then these ellipses represent Mercury, Venus, and then the blue one there is the Earth. That's the Earth orbit for reference. Mars 
And then this, this yellow stripe is actually thousands of asteroid orbits, perfectly circular asteroid orbits inside the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And we're gonna ask the computer, what would happen if we simulate these asteroids motion uh, under the influence of the, of the gravity of the planets? So what we're gonna see is that, so up here in the left, you can see the time running. So this is actually quite a long, a long time, thousands of years. But those initially circular orbits immediately start to change under gravitational perturbations. Now, most of them don't change very much, but you can see that some of them are slowly getting dragged into the inner solar system. Some go outwards and some come inwards, but it's the one that go inwards that we worry about. Now the video quality, I'm not sure how great it is here, but you can certainly see that some of the asteroids orbits are getting changed so that they move into the inner solar system. So these are what we call near earth asteroids. A near earth asteroid is not necessarily one which is always close to the earth or even which passes close to the earth, but usually any asteroid whose orbit uh, is modified so that it travels inside Mars's orbit is one that we call a near earth asteroid and is one that we, we think about. Most of these are not tremendously dangerous, but anything which is moving inwards into the inner solar system, we call a near earth asteroid. And those are the ones which, you know, we occasionally have to think about and worry about and ask, you know, whether or not we need to take any action about them. So this is a little cartoon, which gives you a bit of a, a feeling for what exactly is going on here. It's very humorous, of course. Um, and so we have the main asteroid belt and there's Jupiter, a very massive Jupiter, whose gravity is sort of a, I mean, it doesn't really pick them up and throw them. It's sort of a very slow process, but you might think of Jupiter as being a mean planet, which is throwing rocks at the earth. Uh, at the outer edge of the solar system, you might remember that Kuiper belt, that second asteroid belt that we saw, and, and Neptune, which is the planet which is closest to it, plays a similar role in modifying the orbits of, of bodies in there, and, and it can direct some of them to the inner solar system as well. We're not going to worry too much about those today, but there's sort of two sources of asteroids and comets um, which, which come into the inner solar system. Okay, so... Uh, we've come to our trivia Kahoot. So I think you can play this on Zoom and, and even if you're on the live stream. So the way this is going to work is that you will need a second device, uh, your phone or a second browser tab. And in that other browser tab, you should navigate to kahoot.it and there it will ask you to wait for a pin, which I'm going to provide you. So you can get that out now. I'm going to stop sharing here and, uh, and start sharing a slightly different screen so that we can start that. So, okay, so you should now see uh, the game pin. So if you enter that pin, again, you won't have to download anything to, okay, all right, some people are already on board here, so that's great. So you enter the game pin, you will have to choose a little screen name uh, in order to participate, um, but you don't have to download, okay, we've got some good names here already. Um, you don't have to uh, download any software or anything like that to play. I'm just gonna give a couple of minutes here for people to join. You would actually be able to join um, all throughout the game. So you know, if I get, if I start it, you don't need to worry about, about missing out. You can still join in a little bit later. Hopefully the, the whole thing will go fast enough that we can, uh, uh, that everybody will be able to keep up, but we've got some, some players. And so let's, let's start. So the Kahoot works by the faster your answer. And the, if you get a correct answer, those are both good. So you'll have to answer on your second device. So red, blue, yellow, and green are four names of asteroids. Answer on your second device, which is the second largest in the mean belt. We've seen that Ceres is the largest, uh, but what is the second largest in the mean belt? You can guess if you don't know it, you won't lose any marks for that. And there's a picture of it right there. Okay, so most people knew the answer. Vesta is the, is the largest in the largest asteroid, uh, second largest, sorry, asteroid in the mean belt. 
All those other three are also large asteroids in the main belt. So it's a pretty hard question. You really need to know your stuff here uh, in order to get that one. But I'm happy to see that a lot of people got it. So, so that's great here. So here's our scoreboard. Uh, we'll see whether or not everybody can hold their place. So the second question is the first asteroids were originally considered planets until later being demoted. So here's another reference to Pluto. And again, fast answers are better, but of course you've got to get it correct for full points. So true is blue, false is red. Do you think the first asteroids were considered to be full-fledged planets and then later demoted? Or was, or maybe that wasn't the case. Okay, so that is true. Most people knew that, that's great. So the first several asteroids were actually thought to be planets until it was realized that they were actually quite a bit smaller. So Pluto was not the first one to be demoted, actually. Okay, some motion on the leaderboard. That's pretty good stuff. Uh, we'll see. We'll see whether or not the, they can hold their position here. So another true or false: asteroids are richer in many elements like gold and platinum than the Earth's crust is. These barren rocks. Do they have lots of interesting elements on them? This is maybe not the hardest question. Probably most people know the answer here, but blue for true and then red for false. Looks like we got a lot of answers really quickly there. There's actually a picture of a, of a device trying to extract minerals from asteroid, an asteroid mining device. Yes, of course, most people knew that this is true. So asteroids are, are richer in many rare elements in gold and platinum than the Earth's crust. You might say, if the Earth is made of these asteroids, shouldn't the Earth be the same? The answer is that when the Earth formed, it melted and many of the heavy elements went to the core. And so the Earth's crust is actually depleted in some of those. So a bit of a trick question there. Okay, a lot of motion back and forth here on the leaderboard, that's great. So true or false? The first asteroid was discovered without a series, uh, without a telescope. The first asteroid is series. So true, it was discovered without a telescope or false, it was discovered with a telescope. It's kind of a hard one. You've got to know your history here, but if you don't know, you can guess. True or false? You might wonder what that device is there in the picture. It's the instrument that was used, but was it a telescope? Uh, actually, asked, uh, Ceres was discovered with a telescope. That's, that's a trick question. <laughs> kind of mean. A very hard, a very hard question. A small telescope, 7.5 centimeter telescope. Uh, that The picture that you saw on the previous slide was a reproduction of it. But no, it wasn't discovered with the naked eye, it was discovered with the telescope. Okay, so Ethan's got a pretty strong, strong hold there on the top of the scoreboard here. We've got one more question. So a piece of an asteroid which survives passing through the Earth's atmosphere to the surface is called A, and there's a picture of it. So meteor, meteorite, meteoroid, or kryptonite? Another kind of a tough question. There's a picture of one there. And that's time. Okay, meteorite. Most people got that. A little tricky because uh, there's some similar words there. The meteor is when the particle is burning up in the atmosphere. That fiery phenomenon is called a meteor. And a meteoroid is usually what we call the particle before it gets to the atmosphere. So these are all real words, but um, meteorite is technically the correct one. Okay, so here's our leaderboard. So Robert, four to five. 39.58 got five. Oh, oh, Judy, sorry, got uh, five out of five and 99.942 Apophis, a great asteroid name, uh, is, is first. So thank you all for participating. Um, always a little bit of a fun game. Hopefully that woke some people, woke everybody up after all that boring talk about, um, uh, about, uh, oops, I'm going to stop this so it doesn't keep making noise. And we'll go back to the presentation and okay so um congratulations to our winner for it sorry there's no prizes just bragging rights but uh, some really good uh some great answers there so how do we find asteroids so you might think that you take your telescope and you look out and you look for a rocky maybe potato shaped rock and when you see one you know, you found an asteroid, but actually, uh, again, because of physics, that's not really practical. 
They see the light that we observe asteroids with is a wave. And so it's subject to a process called diffraction when it comes into the telescope. And that essentially um, blurs out many of the details on the surface. And so you can't actually see detail on the surface very well. So the way you find an asteroid is actually, or the fastest way to find one is to take a number of, astro uh, number of images of the same portion of the sky uh, over time and look for something which moves. And so you can see there a moving object um, and that's the asteroid. You might say, why is the asteroid moving when the other things aren't? It's because the asteroid is in orbit around the sun. Uh, the earth is also moving, which contributes to this motion, but uh, all the major surveys which look for asteroids actually use this technique rather than looking for an asteroid floating out in space um, because you, you really don't, it's very hard to get high resolution images of asteroids. Most of the images that I've shown you so far are actually from spacecraft, which have gone up really close to the asteroid to get good pictures, but not through telescopes. And, and so you can discover asteroids using these techniques. And I want to tell you a little story about a student of mine named Cole Gregg, who dis recently discovered an asteroid and, and we put together just a short little YouTube video about how it worked. But if it's on your bucket list to try to discover an asteroid, you can still do that. You don't have to go work for NASA or one of the large uh, telescopes to do that. So he was actually working using a telescope in Spain. It was during the, the COVID times. Uh, and he was using it remotely over the internet. So there you can see the three images taken about 20 minutes apart. Um, and if you zoom in, we're gonna see a zoom in on it here. You, you see that you really cannot see any detail here. It's just a few bright pixels. And again, that's diffraction at work. But from its motion across the sky, he was able to compute its path. And so uh, it was actually a small, relatively small near earth asteroid, which was passing near the earth. This is a recreation of the flyby. It passed sort of harmlessly above, above the Earth, and then it headed back out into space. So we probably won't be seeing that asteroid again for a little while, uh, but kind of exciting. You can actually still discover asteroids, you know, almost from your own, <laughs> I was going to say from your backyard, but he was actually probably just at home somewhere. So, so asteroids, uh, uh, we worry about asteroids. So here's a funny little cartoon, you know, the dinosaur is saying that maybe we should worry about these asteroids. This one didn't hit us, but should we worry about other ones coming up? And, and that's something that, that we think about too. It's possible that an asteroid had something to do with the extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, are we smarter than uh, dinosaurs? Well, what should we do? So first of all, I wanna say, you know, could an asteroid actually destroy the earth in the sense of smashing it into little pieces? Excuse me. Uh, it seems like an asteroid might be able to do that. Uh, a typical asteroid, which is a kilometer across, one of the larger ones which crosses the earth's orbit, might be a billion tons of rock and iron, which would smash into us at pretty high speed. But when you think about it, um, the chance of an asteroid actually smashing the Earth into little pieces, the Earth getting exploded into fragments because of an asteroid impact is really not very likely. Uh, the Earth might be 6 billion trillion tons of rock and iron and has been hit by many, many asteroids of various sizes over the years. And there's not really any danger that the, the um, asteroid is going to um, destroy the Earth. Um, however, there is a, a very thin layer on the Earth that we actually live in, and that is vulnerable. So the ecosphere, uh, uh, the atmosphere and the layer at the surface of the Earth that we live on is much smaller and could be damaged by an asteroid if it was sufficiently large. Uh, if you're worried about asteroids and have been following it, you might know that the, uh, the asteroid which is going to pass closest to us, or sort of the poster child for dangerous asteroids, is asteroid 99942 Apophis. We saw Apophis was apparently playing our uh, Kahoot earlier and did very, very well. Uh, but we now know that Apophis, which will pass close to the Earth in 2029, you can see a graphic of it passing near the Earth here uh, on the screen will actually miss us. So the, the risk is now known to be essentially zero for that 
for an impact on the Earth, but it will pass close to the Earth's satellite belt. And so there's a possibility that the asteroid will actually crash into a satellite, uh, but it is not likely to hit the Earth. It is, is safe. And in fact, I will say that all the asteroids we know about are, you know, for all practical purposes, safe, even though sometimes there are very, very small probabilities in the distant future. So that leads us to the question of, you know, should we worry about asteroids at all? Well, we do know that the Earth has been hit, and this is a good example of it. It's a Behringer crater or meteor crater in Arizona. It's about 1.5 kilometers in diameter, and it's hard to get a notion of the scale, but up on the, on the right-hand side, you'll see a road which kind of snakes across to some buildings which are on the rim, just at the right-hand side of the crater. So it's actually quite a large hole that was caused by an impact of an asteroid, which is uh, probably about 50 meters in diameter. Um, and it created a, this, this crater, which is about a kilometer and a half across. So asteroid impacts have caused some damage to the Earth in the past. The question really comes down to two, two factors when we're talking about the risks, and that is how big are these asteroids? How much damage could they, an impact produce? So here we're typically talking about size, but we really mean the mass. Now, physicists, of course, know that kinetic energy and momentum both have a mass term and a velocity term. So maybe we should be talking about velocity, but we don't usually, and that's because the impact velocity of asteroids has a relatively narrow range, which only varies, varies between a fact, by about a factor of five or so, from about 11 kilometers per second to about 70 kilometers per second. And yes, those are kilometers per second. So those are very fast. Uh, that's why asteroids, part of why asteroids are so dangerous, but there's a relatively narrow range whereas the mass of the asteroids can vary by several orders of magnitude. And so usually when we're talking about the danger due to their, the impact, we're talking about how big the asteroids are, their size or their mass. But of course, we do also need to worry about how many of them are out there. How often does the Earth get hit? So the smallest ones, which are the most common, are fortunately the safest. So if the diameter is less than about 10 meters or so across, the, uh, the asteroid will burn up in the Earth's atmosphere and doesn't pose any real danger. It may drop some rocks, it may drop some meteorites on the surface, but it's, it's really quite minimal danger. And this does actually happen several times per year. Here we've got a really interesting example of it. Some of you might remember that in February, 2013, a, a uh, an 18 meter asteroid, you can see it here on the screen in sort of the center left, uh, entered the atmosphere above the Russian city of Chelyabinsk. The videos that you're going to see here are uh, automobile dash cams, which captured it as people were driving to work in the morning. Um, this is really exciting stuff. These, these images were not taken by scientific instruments per se, but just ordinary dash cams, but they were used actually to reconstruct the trajectory of the asteroid and determine sort of what its path was before it came into the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, you can see a variety of different views here. The fireball lasted between five and 10 seconds or so, and then there was a smoke trail which lingered in the sky for um, you know, several minutes. Uh, so a very, very exciting event. It was brighter than the sun at some points when it was uh, at, at its peak brightness, um, mostly burned up, but did drop some rocks on the ground. But I mostly wanna talk about, um, so if you, if you have sensitive ears like I do, you might wanna turn down the volume. Uh, I uh, hopefully don't have it too loud here, but um, you know, if you know your physics, what happens after a supersonic object passes through the atmosphere near you? Well, it's supersonic. So what you get is a sonic boom. And so this is a video huh? of some people who went out to look at the smoke trail and about a minute after, no. about a minute after the fireball went past, and they heard the sonic boom, which was quite loud. Now, the boom uh, was loud enough actually to break a number of windows. 
and caused some damage to buildings. There was a pressure wave, uh, which was created by this uh, fireball, which actually did do some damage. Now, nobody was killed, but many people were, in fact, injured by flying glass. The wi many windows were broken. Here you can see, again, security footage where a, a window was blown in by this. Uh, on this particular clip, now you, you can't see the window, but there's some people looking out the window, and that pressure wave um, caused damage, fractured the glass, and, and about a thousand people had to be treated for injuries due to, to flying glass. It was actually, there were quite a few injuries here, and it was fortunate that nobody was seriously hurt, as I understand it, but there was some damage. So this is the shock wave. This is the the, the energy being deposited in the air in the form of a supersonic, a supersonic wave. So I, if you caught it earlier, I said that the Chelyabinsk event was an 18 meter event. So a little bit larger than our 10 meter threshold, large enough that it could put a significant amount of energy into the atmosphere in the form of a shock wave. Uh, if it hadn't been so close to a large city, probably the damage would have been much less, but it was sort of big enough to cross that threshold. And there's sort of a range between about 10 meters and a kilometer or so in diameter, where the rock uh, coming in will deposit enough energy to do some damage. Uh, the explosion, the resulting explosion is sometimes likened to a nuclear explosion. It, it wouldn't be radioactive, but there's sort of a sudden deposition of kinetic energy that would cause an something like an explosion. Now, the good news is, is that these events happen quite rarely, maybe only every thousands up to 100,000 years or so. So they're, they're not very common, but they can cause some damage. And if you're worried about uh, the kind of asteroid that could, for example, cause the extinction of the dinosaurs, you have to go to an even larger size. Um, typically, we would say that if it's larger than about a kilometer or so across, then it doesn't really matter where you are on the planet. If the Earth gets hit by an asteroid that big, you're going to have a bad day. Um, so an asteroid of this side would really have global effects. But these are extremely rare, maybe once per 100 million years or so. This is not something that happens every day by any means. So what should we do if we happen to see an asteroid which is headed towards the Earth? Uh, you might be surprised to know that we don't really have the technology right now to deflect or destroy an incoming asteroid or comet, or rather, we're really not quite sure how to do it. You might say, well, don't we have nuclear weapons? Can't we just blast it? And the answer is that might work, but we're not really sure what might happen if you shoot a nuclear weapon at an asteroid. You might just break it up into smaller pieces, which just spreads the damage more wildly, widely. So we really need to do a little bit more testing. And so that brings me to a really interesting mission, which is in flight right now. It's called the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART. And here's a graphic from the mission. Uh, it's going to a really interesting near-Earth asteroid that is not dangerous of all, at all. It, it stays well away from the Earth, but it's chosen because it's suitable for this test. There's an asteroid, a larger asteroid called Didymos, and it has a small asteroid moon called Dimorphos, which orbits around it. So there's a graphic here. You can see the smaller asteroid orbiting the larger one. And a spacecraft is going to come and crash into the smaller asteroid in September of this year. And when the, uh, when the spacecraft crashes into this asteroid, we'll be able to see what happens when you try this kind of kinetic impact or deflection. So the idea is to test what happens if you're trying to deflect an asteroid by just smacking something into it. How, how efficiently do you couple to the asteroid? Does momentum transfer? Do you just break it apart? How well does it work? Is it like hitting a sandbag or is it like hitting a solid rock? So this test will, will happen in September at the end of this year. And in the lower left of this graphic, you can see the Earth. And there's a little, little circle there with a, a telescope dome in there. That's because telescopes on the Earth will be watching to see how much the asteroid has been deflected. It probably won't be very much, but that's okay. This is just a test. We're not worried about this asteroid. We're not trying to deflect it because we're worried about it. We just want to see what happens when you try this kind of thing so we can learn better. So uh, this is a bit of an older slide, but I want to show it because it, it gives a really great overview of the current state of the population and the census of asteroids, if you will. 
So uh, this was produced by the WISE telescope about a decade ago, but it shows asteroids at different sizes and how many we know of and how many we think are still out there. So if we start at the top with the largest asteroids, the ones that are in a kind of brown yellow, those are ones which we've discovered uh, and which we know what their orbits are and they're totally safe. The little green segment represents the fraction of those which we think are still out there, but we haven't found yet. And this of course is always a little bit tricky to try to measure. How do you determine how many are out there that you haven't found yet? But based on the ones that you have found and where you've been pointing your telescope and how easy it is to find asteroids in different locations, you can estimate that. So you can see that most of the risk of the largest asteroids has been retired. That's sometimes what we, we call it. We say that we know, we, we found them, we know their orbits, we know they're safe. So that risk has been retired. Of course, as you go to smaller sizes, there are more asteroids and they're harder to find because they're fainter, harder to see in the telescope. And so there are more and more of them that we haven't seen, but of course uh, they're less dangerous, but there are still some of them out there and we're, we're trying to find them. But the, uh, the idea of this slide is to show you that most of the risk, the largest ones which are the most, pose the largest danger to the earth are the ones which have been cataloged most efficiently and we know them. And so we, we've really done a great job over the last few decades in, in in understanding the, the danger and, and realizing that it's maybe not as large as we might have worried that it was. Now, some people don't find that slide as reassuring because even though we found most of the asteroids, we haven't found all of them. And so it is actually possible that one could be on its way, isn't that correct? And I'd have to say, well, technically, yes, that's true. But what if I was gonna tell you about something which you had to worry about even more than asteroids? Do you know, not where all the asteroids are, but do you know where all the Zambonis are? So Canadians will mostly recognize this ice cleaning machine, popular at hockey games and ice skating events. And you might not think it to look at it, but it's actually more dangerous than asteroids. So the number of Zamboni injuries per year, per year actually exceeds those by asteroids, as you might expect. So the picture you're looking at here, you actually see the Zamboni on the far right, just leaving the frame. And there's a television crew there that got sideswiped by the Zamboni during intermission. I understood that they were not actually severely injured, but they actually were struck by the Zamboni. One wonders exactly how that could have happened. Maybe the Zamboni driver had a bit of a grudge. I don't know the story, but, uh, if you're not worried about Zambonis, then, then maybe you don't need to worry about the even less dangerous asteroids. So, so what should we do? Well, the risk from asteroids is not completely zero. So maybe we shouldn't ignore them. Probably our best strategy is to complete the census of the asteroids to determine whether or not any of them actually pose any danger. Again, at this point, None are known to pose any danger, but there, there is a small fraction left that we don't know about. So I can tell you astronomers are constantly working to, to find more of them, to improve our ability to detect them with better cameras, better telescopes, and to find as many as possible uh, as soon as we can. So in short, support your local astronomers, of course, uh, but don't lose any sleep over the danger from asteroids. So thank you very much for joining us. And I am going to pass this back to our CAP hosts. That's super, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weigert for that presentation um, and talk, uh, very engaging, certainly very interesting. I, I did come into this talk sort of a little bit concerned, but your, your Zamboni example has sort of set me more at ease uh, <laughs> in terms of the future. So. So well, thanks for that. Um, we have a, a number of uh, questions which I will pose to you and, and there's still time to uh, ask more questions if, if folks would like to. So, so the first question, Dr. Wigert, is um, the difference between asteroids and meteor meteoroids. So, so the question is, I thought the difference between asteroids and meteoroids was size. So is, is location also related to their classification? Uh, that, so yes, yeah, so the, the difference between an asteroid and meteoroid is usually 
considered to be the size. So smaller objects are sometimes called meteoroids and, and larger ones are called asteroids. The dividing line is around a meter or so, uh, but it's really a continuum of objects. So meteor, historically people studied meteors and asteroids separately and it was later realized of course that they're the same thing. So we have those two different words, but yes, size is the key determinant it doesn't really matter where they came from or, or what they're made of or anything like that. That's great. The second question has to do with telescopes and the ability to observe asteroids. So specifically, um, can one find or discover an asteroid using a specific type of telescope, a 127 millimeter F12.1 uh, Maxitov Hassegrain? Uh, well, the answer is certainly yes, you could. It wouldn't be easy though. <laughs> so um, uh, the, the reason for that is that in order to discover a, a new asteroid, of course, you need to um, look further at smaller asteroids than are being done currently. So there's, there's no actual reason that any individual telescope can't discover or even see an asteroid. Um, but most professional telescopes, of course, can see uh, much fainter asteroids much further away. And so in, in practical terms, you probably can't, but there's nothing physically preventing that from happening. It's just very difficult. Well, I think that's great news to that one participant. So they'll be able to sort of look up <laughs> and, 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 and use the telescope. Um, the next question is, um, how do you detect asteroids? Is it from their resonant frequencies? Uh, so the, the main way you detect asteroids is, is using the the telescopic images, which I described. So you can take several images of the sky and watch asteroids moving across those images. Um, that is the, the primary technique which gets used for asteroid discovery. That's great. We've got uh, not a question, but a comment from one of the participants who happened to have had the opportunity to hike around the um, perimeter of the Behringer crater a few years ago. Uh, so I thought it was very, very interesting. So a nice connection. Um, the next question is, um, is there any, it has to do with, with the asteroid uh, scattering, asteroid collisions and impacts. Is there any high frequency or Cherenkov radiation emitted during the impact or a collision uh, 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 among asteroids or when it collides? Uh, so that's an interesting question. So to go back to the comment about Behringer Crater, I've also been there and yes, it's fantastic hiking. If anybody hasn't been there, I would strongly encourage you to go. It's quite, uh, uh, it's quite a humbling place to visit. So if you get a chance to visit Meteor Crater, then by all means, please do. Um, but as far as uh, uh, any Kerenkov type radiation during the impact, the speeds are really too slow for that to happen. Um, the asteroids are not charged either, which I, I, I think is typically associated with that. I'm not a, a nuclear or a particle physicist, so I'm probably not the right one to ask about that. But even though the speeds are very high, they, they really are sub-relativistic. So we, we don't usually think of those kinds of high energy phenomenon in that context. Uh, great. And another question, so, so I guess dealing with the composition of asteroids. So, so what percentage of an, of an asteroid is water? Oh, that's a great question because we think uh, uh, the, the most valuable components of asteroids may in fact be water. So I didn't talk too much about asteroid mining. We did have a Kahoot question about that. And people initially thought that the, the most exciting thing about going to an asteroid and mining it would be to take the gold and platinum and, and other um, rare elements out of it. But it may actually be water for astronauts to use and, and to use as fuel. So the, the question of how much asteroid is on sorry, how much water is on asteroids is really a, a, a key question. Now, I sort of said in my talk that asteroids are airless and dry. They certainly don't have bodies of water on them that we're aware of, but they may contain water within some of the minerals or as it may be perhaps as I, subsurface ice inside them. And the question of how much water they actually contain as a percentage depends on the type of asteroid that you're looking at. So some have higher fractions of it into the several percent and then and others have not very much but uh, it, so the short answer is that it varies but it, it is actually one of the key questions about asteroids these days you know and related to the water this was a second part of the question you know um you, what is the status of earth gaining its water from an asteroid hit early you know in, in early time so so that transfer of you know, water from the asteroid to the earth 
Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so it's getting to be kind of a technical answer. But yes, the when the planets were forming, the material which was closer to the sun, of course, would have been hotter and would have had a harder time keeping water in the, you know, in the liquid phase, you know, would have had, or not liquid, um, but would have had a harder time, I suppose, retaining water because it would have tended to go into the vapor phase. And so there, there were actually a lot of questions about, you know, how the earth got its water because the material out of which it formed, the asteroids out of which it formed might have been sort of too hot to contain a lot of water in it. And so the water might have been delivered later. So yes, the current thinking is that most of the water which is on the surface of the earth right now might actually have been delivered later uh, from near earth asteroids impacting the earth after it formed or comets impacting the earth after it formed and delivering some of that water um, kind of at a later date. Um, so yes, the, there's all kinds of really interesting questions related to exactly when and how the earth got all this fantastic water that we have. We've got a, a few minutes for a couple more of these questions. We've got a few questions coming in. So you mentioned uh, apophis. So the question is, why did we call it apophis? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so the, if you discover an asteroid, uh, you have the, the, the honor of suggesting a name for it. So uh, apophis got the name. Uh, it was suggested by its discoverers. Now, I forget exactly who the discoverers were, um, but I believe apophis is one of the Egyptian... Um, one of the Egyptian, pan one of the old Egyptian pantheon gods, um, but it, it got its name um, partly because of its its sort of threatening nature when it was first discovered. When we first found it, we we thought it might be dangerous, but that was a name suggested by the discoverer. Uh, and one other question here, so. Um, and I think it was referring to a comment you might have made in your talk, though I'm not completely sure on this. How does Jupiter prevent the meteor belt from forming into a planet? Yeah, so that's a great question. So uh, how could Jupiter prevent all these asteroids from coming together when everywhere else uh, it didn't seem to be a problem? That's still a bit of an open question. But the answer seems to be that, so if you imagine you know, all these rocks floating in space and their gravity wants to pull them together to, uh, to form a planet. Uh, the problem is that, you know, when you take two rocks and you smack them together, um, they don't necessarily stick together, right? So one thing that can happen is that they can break, they can fracture and fragment and pieces can go flying. So if things are coming together too fast, that might actually be a bad thing. And so the thinking is that Jupiter, which, has, which is a massive planet with a strong gravity, is kind of stirring up the orbits of the uh, asteroid belt so much that asteroids in that region, when they collide, actually collide at, at too high a speed to stay together. And in other regions of the solar system where they're not being stirred up as much, the collisions are much more gentle and the material can stick together and gradually build the form of planet. But that's still a bit of an open question. We're not quite sure why, why that is. Uh, and one other question, thank you very much. One other question here is, um, is there potential for life in the subsurface of asteroids? Um, given, you know, there's a sort of a mixture of briny water and, and, and rocks below the surface. Wow, that would be really cool. <laughs> I, I'm not a biologist, so I can't comment on that. Um, uh, I, I'm not an, I can't give you an expert opinion on that. I think it would be fantastic if that were the case. As far as I know, there, there's no any no indications currently that 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 there is any life on any on any asteroids. But if there were liquid water under the surface and an appropriate um, appropriate chemical environment, I suppose it is possible. Um, but uh, I'm not enough of an expert to make a pronouncement one, one way or another, except to say that that would be really fantastic if that were the case. And I guess a related question, so, and I guess this will, be, this will be the last question. So how well do we know the composition of asteroids? Yeah, well, we're starting to learn it better and better. Uh, the, we've always known a little bit about it from looking at asteroids through telescopes because the, we see the light from the telescope and that light actually gives us information about the surface composition. 
But recently with missions uh, to the asteroids where material is actually being collected and being returned to the earth where we can examine it in the lab, we're learning a lot more about it. So um, it's actually a very, very exciting time for people who study asteroid compositions because we're starting to get these samples from missions like the OSIRIS-REx mission, which I, which I mentioned, which allow us to really study the, the asteroid compositions in detail. So we know something now, but our learning, our knowledge is growing by leaps and bounds. That's great. And we, we, have, uh, we have other questions coming in, but I'm going to have to sort of close out the, the, the question and answer period now. Um, uh, I hope uh, folks or participants uh, will uh, stick around for the breakout uh, room and you can sort of continue to ask your questions and we'll, we'll keep track of the questions that you put in the chat. But at this time, I just want to say a few thank yous. I'm just going to take over the screen here. Yes, please do. Here. Uh, okay, uh, at this time, I wanted to take an opportunity to um, uh, thank a number of people for uh, who worked uh, to make this uh, uh, presentation today possible. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Professor uh, Dan Zhao from the University of Windsor, who uh, stepped in uh, as, uh, as our initial host. I also want to thank our regional coordinator, Dr. Uh, Sarah Das, uh, uh, who helped in organizing this event. And also to Dr. Ken Vos uh, and Pascal Boso. Uh, they were scheduled again to be our hosts today, uh, but all of whom are from the University of Lethbridge uh, and were unable to participate because of the lockout at the University of Lethbridge, but they did a lot of work in terms of helping to organize this presentation. Uh, a big thank you to Francine Ford, Alicia Forgi, uh, and Vicky Van Massenhoven, and uh, Jenny uh, Cleaver at the CAP office. Uh, and a big thank you to Dr. Uh, Wiegert for both an informing and engaging presentation. I really enjoyed the Kahoot uh, and probably <laughs> will look to use that in my own classes. So thank you. Uh, and thank you all for, for participating today. Um, the, the fifth talk of the CAP lecture series this year will be by Professor uh, Rog uh, Rogerio de Souza, and it'll be uh, next week, Wednesday, March 23rd at 11 a.m. Uh, uh, Eastern. Uh, uh, and his talk is titled From Quantum Mechanics to Quantum Computers. So I really hope uh, that you all attend that presentation as well. And information is on the CP website. So uh, uh, at this stage, uh, as a, a reminder, everyone, all participa participating students uh, and participants uh, uh, are invited to remain uh, to have uh, uh, participated in an informal discussion with Dr. Wiegert uh, in the breakout room. Uh, we look forward to, to your attendance if you have time and are interested. Uh, and on behalf of the CAP and CAP uh, Foundation, I thank you very much for your participation today. Thank you again, Dr. Wiegert, uh, and have a great day, everyone. Thank you.